You're listening to the Career Musician Podcast with creator and host, Nomad. With 20 plus years of experience in the music industry, Nomad has done just about everything to earn a living as a career musician. From being music director to celebrity artists, playing iconic arenas and stadiums, composing for film and TV, and even playing your average local club gigs, he's done it all. Nomad's mission is to empower musicians across the globe with strategies for a sustainable career while blasting stereotypes and to bring you tried and true wisdom from his colleagues in this crazy business we call music. Welcome to the Career Musician Podcast. On this episode, we have Erica Goutron. Erica has toured the world with Jason Derulo as the featured female singer of his show, and now she is pursuing her own solo career. After being shelved and then eventually dropped by the record deal she was signed to, Erica decided to pick herself up and take on the world as her own career musician artist. Let me tell you, this is exactly what it takes to be a tried and true career musician for life. Erica will be an inspiration to us all as she has not allowed any circumstance to keep her from pursuing her dreams. Check it all out right here on the Career Musician Podcast. All right, welcome to another episode of the Career Musician Podcast. I am with the talented Erica Goutron. Did I say it right? (laughs) Yes, that works. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Welcome. Welcome. Actually, Erica and I were just talking about the pronunciation of her last name, and you were telling me (laughs) that it's French by descent? Yes, it is. I have Latin. I have, um, I'm Mexican and French and a couple other things, but those are the main ones. But yeah, I I say Goutron. That's an American way to say it but you know okay. you can say how you said it <laughs> yeah, nice nice yeah. and where are you from originally erica i'm from la born and raised really yes wow That's like my wife good. you're an anomaly that you guys yes. are rare right <laughs> not many of us yes <laughs> exactly which part of la did you grow up in any specific area i was more in the outskirts i don't know if you've heard of temple city but that's like kind of near arcadia Pasadena. So half of my life was there. And then the other half was in um, Walnut, California, which is kind of by Pomona. And I currently live in North Hollywood. So nice. Very cool. Yeah. So a true native of the Los Angeles territory. Yes. County. Cool. There you cool. go. <laughs> county. Right, right, right. That's a better yes. word for it. So how did you get started in music? And tell us a little bit about your history. You're a singer, which I want to get to. You have an awesome solo project, which is super dope. I want you to talk you. about that. <laughs> but tell us how you get started. Was it piano? Was it vocal? What was it? What got you? What bit the bug? What was the bug bite there? I got started on piano, actually. My brother had a keyboard and I was a little girl, I was like eight, and I was sneaking in his room when he was gone, and I would just play the piano, and I kind of just figured it out by myself. I never really had professional lessons. I went to YouTube University. <laughs> and, I love um, that. I love that. <laughs> yeah, and I, I discovered singing when I was eight as well, but I hid it, actually. I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell my parents. I was really shy, very timid. I had stage fright, and Yeah, I finally, senior year of high school, that's when I was like, okay, I got to figure out what I want to do in life. I'm no longer going to be in high school. So I was like, I want to be a singer. So I pursued it. My parents found out because I went, I participated in a talent show in my senior year and I actually won it. And I sang Etta James at last. And my parents were like, what? Nice, nice. So So that's kind of how it started. But uh, I was awesome. the piano first. Yeah. So was Etta James one of your first vocal influences? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. We definitely. Who, who so. else? Yeah. Who else was in that category that influenced you? Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah. I grew up in a Christian home, so I listened to a lot of gospel music, like Kurt Franklin and Fred Hammond, and right. so th- those are kind of my roots. And my mom had a couple of records. She had the Earth, Wind, and Fire best of. I would be like this little girl, just like <laughs> listening to yeah. Earth, Wind, and Fire. And yeah, Lauren Hill, Destiny's Child, Beyonce, all that. That's so cool. I was just talking to another wonderful singer yesterday. 
Mesa Leak. I don't know if you've heard of her. She goes by Mesa. She used to mm-hmm. work with the band Incognito, but she also has her solo project. And we were talking about Earth, Wind and Fire and all mm-hmm. these different influences. And I think so many of us can relate to all of the soul, R&B yes. influences, the greats, the Stevie Wonders, the Earth, Wind and Fires, mm-hmm. the great mm-hmm. blues singers, jazz singers. It's so important. It's such an integral part mm-hmm. of what the American music culture is now, right? Yeah, foundational almost, yeah. Absolutely, so it sounds like you have a great foundation. Yes, those are my roots for sure. That's excellent. And then how did you cross the bridge from just being a musician to actually being a career musician and actually start working? (laughs) I had stage fright, so that's where I left off in my story. So I went to college, I went to Citrus College and took this performance class for three years almost, and the teacher transformed me. So I overcame that fear. I started putting YouTube videos out, like covers, and I actually got discovered by this producer named Red One. He produced a lot of Gaga stuff, like Bad Romance, Poker Face, Just Dance. And so that's the Red One. Mm -hmm, Yeah. Yeah. So I got signed to him when he was really hot with Gaga. And so I dropped out of college and just full time was writing music, making music, but I got shelved pretty much. I had like one single to show for those almost five years of being signed to him. And I don't regret it. It was very, very, it was a growing experience. I connected with a lot of people because of that. So After that, I've been an independent artist ever since, and I've been making music, and I started gigging. I went on a few tours, and yeah. So so you said some really good stuff there. I want to unpack a few of these little things (laughs) here. There's some great (laughs) nuggets that I want to, you know, dive in here. Okay, so number one, so Red One discovered you, like you said, and he signed you to a production deal. Now, one of the things that I'm a huge proponent of is understanding business. And Mm. it's tough because oftentimes when we get started in the business, we're young. And the younger we are, the less experienced we are, the less we know about business. That's why this podcast and this whole platform exists. Mm. So I'd love to hear about... (laughs) Yeah, well, thank you. And and thank you for being a guest once again. I'd love to hear Mm -hmm. about what did you learn from that process? You know, number one, did you get a contract and did you sign that contract? Did you have a manager? Did you Mm -hmm. have your folks help you? Did you have legal counsel? Like what was the process like just with that production deal to start off with? Okay. So I was 19 when I signed to him. I was very young. I didn't know anything about anything (laughs) regarding the business. (laughs) So I was just this naive girl I'm like, mom, like this producer wants to sign me and he produces Lady Gaga. She's this crazy pop star. So I'm just like, oh my God, this is my big break. And so I get this lawyer through a friend. I didn't really even know him. And it wasn't a good fit because I think you got to find a lawyer who's actually invested and passionate about you. You know, please say that again. Yes. Yes. So true. (laughs) They need to believe in you because then really it's just, it's a waste of money. It's a waste of time and maybe not completely a waste, but it's not as like, you're not getting as much out of it as you can. And there just needs to be that passion there. And I don't, I'm not quite sure he had that. So he just was trying to, you know, make money. (laughs) And so anyways, I signed a deal. It was a 360 deal. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I got a manager after that, but the manager that I got was actually working for Red One. So it was like a complete conflict of interest. And <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a conflict. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, that, these are huge things that you just don't do. And that's I learned right. from experience. But um, that's right. Like you said, though, it wasn't a waste because you learned from the experience. Yes. So yes. that's amazing. Okay. So, and the other thing you said was in five years, you got one single that was released, a lot of yeah. other songs were shelved. But again, mm-hmm. I really like the way you're looking at it with an optimistic view. Mm-hmm. Hey, I got the one single, I learned a lot, and it yeah. helped me meet a bunch of other people. Yes, absolutely. So talk about how you use that as leverage. Yeah, so I connected with a lot of writers, producers, just a lot of industry people. And although I left that contract, I didn't lose those contacts that I made. And so after that, I was able to have people I can work with. I wasn't just like, okay, now what? Like, I'm lost now. You know, because some people, 
a lot of artists are like, I don't even know where to go. I don't know right. who to work with. Like, how do I get in there? So I had access to the industry because of that, even though I was shelved. But it was a good thing because I was able to work with people. And then those people introduced me to other people and so on and so forth. And that's why I really was grateful for that. And I learned about PR. I didn't even know what PRO was. And <laughs> there was a situation where I actually wrote a song and it got on a movie and I wasn't credited. I still haven't received any money from it. And these are things that like, as a little girl, I mean, you know, I was 19. Yeah, no, I get it. <laughs> I have a 13 year old daughter, so I totally get it. She'll be 19 soon. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, in my head, I, I felt like this this little girl in this big, like scary industry. And, right. And yeah, and those are things that I've learned. So I, I gained a lot of knowledge and made a lot of contacts. So yeah. I'm so glad you brought up the term PRO, the acronym. And that yeah. for those who don't know, it's Performing Rights Organization. The popular ones here in America are ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, although a little less mm-hmm. popular, although it's becoming more affluent in, as time goes on in the industry. Mm-hmm. When you're writing a song and you get credited, you become a writer, right? Mm-hmm. That information gets tracked down in the PRO, the Performing Rights Organization, they mm-hmm. take your name, they take your legal name, all your information, and they assign you what's called an IPI number. Mm-hmm. That IPI number is your identification as a songwriter. Mm-hmm. And then whenever that song gets placed in a movie or TV, film, or even online, like in a YouTube video, that IPI number is a digital watermark. It's digitally watermarked into the song. So they report it to the PRO, and that's how you get your money. It's crazy, yes. right? <laughs> yep, I didn't know any of that. <laughs> yeah, there's so many steps. Yeah. So I would say this to all of those listening. Again, thank you for bringing this up. If you're a writer or composer, sign up with a PRO, whether it's ASCAP, yeah. BMI, or CSAC. And then the next question is, well, which one do I sign up for? Well, that's where you have to use what I call your Google stick, your phone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just do some due diligence. Look it up. There you yeah. go. There you go. <laughs> That's it. So yeah. are you signed? Are you with one of those now? One of the PROs? Yeah, I'm with ASCAP. Okay, yeah. great. I've been great. with ASCAP the whole time. And right. I figured that since yeah. you have all your own material and everything. Yeah. Yes. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So again, what a valuable lesson, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I could have made a lot of money because it was, it was a pretty, it was a good situation. It was a, it was a good popular movie. And, and yeah, so I, I felt really sad about that, but I just learned yeah. it. I use it as a learning experience and right. it yeah. happens. It has no, to happen almost. It yeah. does. It does, right? We all have to touch the hot stove before we realize that it can hurt us. Yeah. It hurts. So yeah. I know. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> all right. So then you stopped working with Red One. And at that point, did you start writing with a bunch of other people in the studio? Yes, Which I seems did. seems to be the natural trajectory, right? Yeah. Yes. I started writing. I started gigging. That was my life. I would write by day and I would gig at night, usually on the weekends, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And that was my life for a few years. And I I just started sharpening my skills, getting comfortable on stage and also just sharpening my writing skills, just growing as an artist and finding out what my voice is, what my message is, what my sound is. And it's ever evolving, but I mean, there's a difference between when I started signed to Red One. I didn't know (laughs) where to go, who I was. You got to know who you are. And that's what I did. I learned who I was in a lot of regards. So That's great advice. That's really good advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Introspectively, what did you do to learn who you are? Were you journaling? Were you writing lyrics and poetry? What kind of work did you do to kind of discover yourself? Just trial and error experience. Yeah, just going in the studio and just doing it. You just got to do it. I like that. I like that. Like, (laughs) that's the only way to figure it out. You just almost got to just jump in the pool, you know, like jump in on the stage. Like, you got to know what's your vibe on stage. What's that like? There's different kind of vibes and you only learn by doing it. So that's right. That's that right. And, and, and yeah, I did journal and writing is kind of like journaling, that's you know, <laughs> So as you're gigging around town, which now I know most of us haven't gigged in like, what, five, six months. It's kind of nice. 
Yeah. Sadly, yes. This too shall pass. We'll get through it. Oh, yeah. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Well, as you're gigging around town, you're meeting new people, you're working, like you said, you're developing the duality, the writing and the artistic side, but also yeah. the performance aspect, right? Yeah. Um, what are some of the gigs that you did around town? Any particular bands or venues that you played in town? You know, that yeah, were- I actually <laughs> started at this Filipino restaurant. That was my first gig. It was pretty popping, actually. A lot of Filipinos would come and they love music and, oh, yeah. and it was popping. And so I started doing that every Thursday. I got a residency and then I nice. met musicians and I got more gigs, more restaurants. And then I started, then I got connected with uh, an agency that does like weddings so I did corporate stuff. And then through that, I got involved with this app called Jam Card that has a lot of musicians. And I got a Party Next Door tour. So that was my first tour. It was a U.S. tour. And from there, just, you know, same thing. What was um, the name of that tour? The Party Next Door. Um, he party. was opening for Palsy. It was called the... Nice. I forget what it was called. <laughs> okay, I haven't heard... Fountain, I have Fountain Kingdom. Oh, dig, dig, yeah. Yeah. Of course, I know Elmo Lovano and Jack Pyatt and those guys over at Jam Card really well. Yeah. Yes, they're great people. It's a great network that they've built. Yeah, they really built something amazing. And I got two tours out of that, out of Jam Card. So that shows you how big. Really? So the tour opening up for Halsey and then what was the other one? Jason Derulo. Okay, so that's I back up for him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. I didn't want to be presumptuous, but okay. So you did get Jason Derulo's tour using the Jam mm-hmm. Card app. Yes. That's yes. pretty dope. So that, yeah, they were like looking for background vocals for this artist. DM me if you're interested. So I did. They gave me the address, the address to the rehearsal or um, the audition. I mean, and I auditioned and I got it. And you nailed it. Really fun. <laughs> yeah. For the people who want to come out to LA, maybe who don't live here. Or even the people that do live here, but they want to do the same thing that you're doing. Talk about that audition process because so many people, even myself, I came out in 2005 and I had to audition for a bunch of gigs. Mm -hmm. It could be nerve wracking, but like you said, you have to know who you are. Yeah. And I believe that you have to have confidence, not arrogance. There's a fine line. Absolutely. Tell us about the audition for Derulo from your perspective. So the audition for Derulo, was, it was very nerve wracking because it was almost like American Idol. He actually went to the audition and there was a table with him and the MD and, and a couple other people. And then all the singers were in the room and then there was a stage and you would come up and Derulo with everyone in the room would just watch you perform. And it was very nerve wracking because he's just looking right at you and it's a smaller room. And so there was phenomenal people there. I was like in my head, oh, they're going to get it for sure. So I actually, you know, that tour actually built my confidence because I actually still struggled with it a little bit. I overcame my stage fright, but because of some things in my childhood that made me very timid and self-conscious of myself, it's like a little demon that you just, you got to like get rid of. And it's almost like you got to have control over it. I'm not sure if it ever goes away almost. Um, That's right. I couldn't agree with that more, by the way. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You just got to have control over it. I feel like you have to put, yeah, put in a ton of positive influences Uh, and information, mm -hmm. right? That's exactly what I did. Yeah. Yeah. I started listening to podcasts every day and filling myself up with like positive faith filled things that build me up. But anyway, so back to the audition, I actually thought for sure I wasn't going to get it. And I was like, oh, these, that girl killed it. Oh my God, that person just killed it. They're going to get, I actually messed up. I messed up in my audition and there was like a second, a full on second where I just stopped. And then I just go, Wow. Um, I think he just saw in me what I struggled to see in myself. And so that tour and being in front of a stage like that, or being on a stage with that many people just like made who I am come out more. And sometimes you're in situations that allow you to come out more. And yeah, it's so true. You got to have confidence. You got to have confidence. I was blessed to have to be in a situation where someone saw it in me when I didn't really fully see it in myself yet. So ever since then, that was like two years ago, I almost feel like I've transformed even more than I have before that. So that's amazing. As we say, life is not a marathon. Well, not, it's not a race. It's, a, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Sorry. It's a long Absolutely. journey. And all mm-hmm. these pieces go into making our life experience what it is. That's right. Mm-hmm. So to harp on this a little bit more, sorry, because I love auditioning. <laughs> and it's so funny because I've auditioned for a lot of people, but I've also held 
a lot of auditions as mm. the music director for Babyface for 10 years. Yeah. I, I had to audition a lot of people. I would always give auditionees a little pep talk before they would come mm-hmm. in and do their, I'd be like, hey, listen, so glad you could be here. I want you to be yourself. Please don't be nervous. Don't worry about anything. Mm-hmm. Just do what you do. Like that was always my, just that's my way. I wanted to put everybody yeah. at ease. Right, right. But because I've done a lot of auditions, I know mm-hmm. that's not how everybody runs it. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> so uh, there's a yeah. term, cattle call. Was it a cattle call? Meaning like there's a lot of people in line? Yeah, there was. Like, was well, it? there was like 50. Okay. It's so, like, I mean, you think about that. That is very nerve wracking. I remember when I auditioned for Baby yeah. Fist, there was six other guys and myself, so seven. And we all had guitars. Yeah. So that's not really bad, actually. You think seven people, you think, okay, that's not bad. One out of seven, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. one out of 50, those odds are higher. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I was so shocked. Every time it dwindled down, I was like, oh, oh, what? <laughs> like, until I got it. And something I learned also was it's not just about your talent. Like, it's actually, there's so much more that, like, yeah. people look for. And yeah, you got to know your skill and have that sharpened and popping. But they also, the industry, they like having a look and it's just part of it. Like the look and, and just having your style, like, and have your own vibe. That's you that stands out and it's cool. That's right. Like a lot of them look for that. And a lot of people might be like, well, that's just wrong. And I could see that aspect of that. You know, because right. we might think, well, it should just only be about the music. And I get that. But sadly, that's not all, only what it's about. It's also it's like, a vibe. Yeah. yeah. It's like the old saying, it's called showbiz for a reason, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, it is true. I agree with you. Okay. So you did the audition. You got the gig. Did you find out that day or did they do callbacks and, and that? Yeah, I found out that day. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. I didn't even leave... Yeah, we didn't even leave yet. We left the room and they talked for 10 minutes and then it came out and said, this is who got it, so. That's awesome, that's awesome. (laughs) Hi, I'm Erica Gutron and I'm a career musician. Subscribe to the brand new Career Musician YouTube channel, now streaming all of the Career Musician podcast episodes. Want to learn more about a particular topic? Tag at the Career Musician and use hashtag Career Musician to let us know what you'd like to hear. Empowering musicians with solutions for a sustainable career in the music industry. Subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Download, subscribe, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any of your favorite podcast platforms. All right, so now let's talk about the next step. Again, I love the fact that you're sharing with the community here because I do feel there's a lot of young people that need to hear this who are aspiring to do the same thing. Now you got the gig. How did you prepare to go on tour? Did you talk to somebody? Did you have a mentor? What were some of the things you did to get prepared for that? Did I have a mentor? I didn't really have a mentor. Yeah, that was my first world tour. The other tour was a smaller one. It was just like a few cities in in the U.S. It was really scary for me. I just played the songs over and over and over (laughs) until I just got sick of it. Like, I just was like, I need to have this in my bones and my soul. Like, I just need to know it to where I don't even have to think about it. So that, that way I can focus on everything else, the confidence, the stage presence and right. connecting. So, Now, did you yeah, guys have to I dance did. a lot? Not me. He had dancers. Because he, he has a lot of dancers, dancers. right. right, he right. Does. <laughs> yeah. I think he just wanted like a girl to just stand there and look pretty and sing. Like, there I think that's what he wanted. So I just had to play that part for him. And he had me sing. I had a featured moment with him for a duet in the middle of the show as well. Nice. Which is crazy. <laughs> and he had me in this crazy gown and yeah. wow that must have been really cool <laughs> yeah he had a stylist come in and right and fit me with these like crazy expensive gowns that's awesome so i mean you're talking probably 15 to thirty thousand people a night that you guys are performing for yeah yeah all over the world yeah. and it's your first world tour that's yes. a big deal it's insane yeah that's beautiful 
But now you're I hadn't pro. Even, yeah, I hadn't even been outside of the country other than Toronto once. I yeah. hadn't been outside of the U.S. So. But now you're a pro. You got it. It's just like, you've done <laughs> it, right? <laughs> yes, yes. That's awesome. That's awesome. No, it always helps to get the first tour in your system and just done because you learn so much. Now, yeah. let's talk about something that a lot of people don't, might not think is a big deal, but I like to talk about it. Tour essentials, packing and gear and your little items and little tips and tricks. Yes. What did you learn about that? Or what do you like to do for that? Um, I actually didn't know that Europe had different outlets. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I couldn't straighten or blow dry my hair. And for a girl, that's like devastating, especially if you're doing a duet with <laughs> Jason Derulo, yeah. you want your hair looking all crazy. But um, yeah, and I, I couldn't charge my phone. And I was just like, oh my gosh. So I had to scramble and do that right. in a country that doesn't really speak my language. Right. So that's important. That's something to know. Prepare, bring, if you get a cold, you want to bring like, I brought cold remedies and stuff like yeah. that because it was in the winter and people got sick. It's kind of weird talking about that now that like we're in a pandemic. <laughs> it is, it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. are great tips. Did you become yeah. friendly with the tour manager? Yeah, I did. I believe that helps when you have a good rapport with the tour manager. You know, you could always hit them up and be like, hey, I, I could use some assistance with X, Y, Z, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's helpful. Definitely. Helpful. That's awesome. All right. So moving right along, talk about your health and lifestyle when you're, especially on the road, because at home it's a little easier because we have the routine, mm -hmm. we just do it. But on the road, yeah. the schedule is so crazy. How did you stay in shape and maintain your health? That was actually one of the bad parts of the tour is I came back really sick. Like my health was in jeopardy. Yeah. Like, and I was going through personal stuff and breakup. And during that time, it did put a weight on my relationship. And yeah, I had this thing called Graves disease. I had it a long time ago. And I guess the tour because of the stressful lifestyle made it come back. And all the symptoms came back. So I was like 30 pounds lighter. And wow. Yeah, I just think because of like the stress of it and I wasn't used to it. And I hand the food, they're catering food to you. You just eat what's <laughs> what's right. there. Sure. The drinking, you know, the, a lot of partiers on tour. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I partied a lot, but yeah. There's just alcohol flowing left or right. Constantly, <laughs> and, I know. Yeah. Yes. And it's that's, true. that's true. not good for your health. So. Yeah. yeah, that's something I learned. You really got to prepare for your health because for me, it, it took a toll on my body. Okay. So. But so you came home and you focused on getting healthy. I focused on getting healthy, yeah, because Graves' disease is this thing. It's an autoimmune disorder that attacks the thyroid and the thyroid controls metabolism. So mine was over, overly working. My metabolism was like on 100. So just to walk up the stairs was like, felt like an intense cardio workout. And it affected my performing, and I almost lost one of my biggest gigs <laughs> because of it. I couldn't hang because I was out of breath. Right. I do believe the tour triggered that because I wasn't prepared on how to fight it in regards to my health. You know. But now you're well informed. If you do another long tour like that, you know what to do. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Mm -hmm. So you get home from tour. You get healthy. What did you do? Yeah. Did you get back in the local scene or did you just buckle down and focus on doing your thing as an artist or kind of everything? Everything. Everything. Yeah. Um, it's I tough, had, isn't it? It's a lot to juggle. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot to juggle. But I don't know. I got this taste when I was on tour of almost like the thing that I want. Like I, As much as I like singing back up and that was fun, I'm like, I want to be the one doing yeah. the show. Right. <laughs> like, I want right. to be the one that. headlining. Exactly. And so it just made me like kind of bunker down and, and really roll up my sleeves and just get in the studio and start writing and get my vision locked in. And it just motivated me even more. So yeah, I mean, I gigged because I had to pay bills and right. that was my full-time job, but it made me work even harder as an artist. And it made my vision even clearer and just more hungrier. So. That's awesome. That's, and that's exactly yeah. what needs to happen. Yeah. I always tell people that they need to make cognitive decisions about what they want to do in the industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, you can have a whole career just being a side man, you know, a side person, right, a side right. woman, a side musician, whatever, mm -hmm. backing other people up. Yeah. And it's great. 
You can yeah, make a good living. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can make a good living. You can hustle and you can see the world and all this mm -hmm. great stuff. So it's amazing. But if you feel that you are an artist, I think it's better to decide that early on. Absolutely. You know, <laughs> and that's important because you can get distracted yes. by something that's for sure. Like, oh, I can go on another tour. That's for sure money. It's fun. But then like, if you keep doing that, time just passes and, you, and years go by and you're like, man, I still haven't pursued my artist career, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you are like, so as you say that stuff, my skin is crawling because I'm like, oh my God. And again, this is the reason why I developed this whole platform because I think it's very important for musicians to decide whether they want to be a side person or an artist yeah. early mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. yes. Right? Yes. And then you were saying, yeah, you can get lost in, you know, yeah. doing these other gigs and mm -hmm. making good money. and Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so important. And I think this goes for anything in life. You just need to know what your end goal is. You need to know what the vision is so you can know what to say no to. And not everything you say no to is something bad. It's just not going to take you to your end goal or your destination, you know? So <laughs> that's... Yes, that's, this is the whole yeah. premise of the career mm -hmm. musician. I feel like mm -hmm. a broken record because I say this so much. But you wow. know, one of the things I talk about is you're not really negotiating unless you're willing to say no. Mm -hmm. so let's say somebody mm -hmm. offers you a gig and they say, I'll pay you $100 for the gig. And you say, well, wait a minute. Yeah. I have to drive two hours. I have to perform yeah. four sets. And then I have to drive another two hours. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you want me to bring my own gear and wardrobe? <laughs> okay. Uh, I might yeah. have to pass. <laughs> I'm going to have to pass. And there's nothing wrong with saying no, thank no. you. Mm -mm. You know, and I think we have to develop that skill set of negotiating yeah. and being comfortable with those decisions. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay to say no, you know, right. it's so okay. And even if like, for example, the tour, right. Say they, they want me to go back on tours, a six month tour right. and they, it pays really well. And it's not a matter of if it'll be worth it. It's just a matter of like, it's almost like you're not looking at the money. You're looking at time. Because that's a different kind of currency. That's you know? wise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yes. time is something you can't get back. Money you could get back. Time you can't. So you just got to really pick and choose what's going to take you to your destination. Yeah, like, bro, come on. You're crushing it. That is, <laughs> that is the embodiment of wisdom Yay. right there. Yes. Perfect. All right. I'm glad. All right. Okay, so I was just going to say, perfect segue, any words of wisdom, but that is the perfect <laughs> word there of you wisdom. Know. So yeah. let me ask you this, any memorable moments when you were on tour, anything funny or unique that stood out to you? <laughs> yes. So Jason had a music video, Goodbye, I don't know if you've heard it, featuring Nicki Minaj and David Guetta. Yeah. He asked me to be the lead girl in that music video because... He didn't want to go through like finding someone, a model or holding auditions or anything. He was just like trying to get it quick because yeah. he wanted to get it out quick. So he asked me to be his lead girl and I was just like, okay, <laughs> 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 like, what is this turning into? And so they asked me some questions. Like the videographer asked me like, are you comfortable with being in a bathtub with him and like kissing him? And I was, <laughs> I was like, whoa. And I said, no, yeah. nothing against, you know, anyone who says yes, but I just wasn't comfortable. So I just remember like, oh my gosh, what? We um, shot the video and I was like in bed with him. Like I had to pretend like I was sleeping and he's like getting out of bed. And yeah, he was just like holding me. And I just remember thinking like, how did I get here? <laughs> like, <what? laughs> and um, yeah. we shot one of the scenes live in one of the shows. And we had one take because we had one videographer. So they had Jason told the whole stadium, that girl right there is, is going to walk through. So you guys need to like split, almost like this, the Red Sea party. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and like it's split and like she's going to walk through and it's going to be part of my video. And so I just, I walked through the whole stadium was just looking at me and I'm in the crowd this time. I'm not on stage. So I can see them just like their eyeballs like on me. And I just had a I had to execute it because we had one take. And so, yeah, that was probably one of the craziest memories from that tour for me. And you crushed it. 
I, I, there you yeah. go. <laughs> there yeah, you go. Somehow, somehow. The moral of the story is you crushed it. That's it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Look, when you have to pull together and really deliver, the human spirit has a way of just yeah, doing pushing it. Pushing through, yeah. right? Yeah. Adrenaline. Exactly. The adrenaline gets running. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Hey, before we go, because I know you got to run out, you're doing a really cool streaming gig. Yes. Talk about that. And I know you're going to do some more of those, I'm sure, in the near future, hopefully. Yeah. So as you know, like we've been out of work (laughs) because of the pandemic and haven't been working for five months. And I haven't had any gigs other than a couple here and there. And so I started to go fund me because I'm trying to figure out how to pay my bills, let alone fund in music with a music project with music videos. So I started to go fund me and... Tomorrow I have a show to raise money for that. And I have one the following weekend. And I'm actually thinking of keeping it going and making it a virtual show where we charge people to tune in, just like a regular show. So, yeah, that's what that is. It starts at 8 p.m. tomorrow. 8 p.m. Okay, and you can tune on? I'm partnering with Track Life, which is a music platform that promotes artists, especially up-and-coming ones. So it'll be at their studio, so their YouTube channel. So it's T-R-A-K-L-I-F-E, Track Life. And it'll be on their YouTube channel, Streaming Live. So Sweet. Yeah. So I'm looking at the flyer now. Erica, E-R-I-C-K-A yes. dot tracklife.com. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Okay. So hopefully this keeps on going on a regular basis. Yes, uh, for sure. And a big shout out to our mutual friend, Eric G, for connecting us. I call him G money. <laughs> G money. Yeah. Dang. Taking it back. Yeah. <laughs> so tell that us about cool. your whole project and you know, what singles you have out right now. So I put out an EP last year, actually, no end of 2018. That was called a thousand skins, which I'll be performing all the songs from that tomorrow. And little things is a single. I'm thinking of just doing singles every month yep. with music videos or i might do i might put it all together in a project i'm not sure i'm just trying to it's hard to decide at, yeah yeah <laughs> looking know. at the market like it yeah. just seems like a single kind of life right now <laughs> do you know when the next single is going to come out yes i have a bunch of singles ready and lined up i just need money for it to be mixed and and i want to do music videos and i want to market it right so that's why i'm doing this gofundme just right. so i can like i'm not just putting out good music i have a plan and a strategy so that it can actually get out there and be executed in the way that i would like for it that's to be. right and, that's yeah right. the way it deserves to be i feel like and so so that's my plan right now it's called unstoppable i think it'll come out next month well look sense unstoppable you definitely are and you're saying all the right things you're doing all the right things i mean you just said plan and that's a big thing again you have to plan Mm -hmm. stuff out there's pr campaigns there's marketing there's social media that's on top of the music and then you know talking about the music itself right so much (laughs) creativity Yeah. yeah Well, kudos to you. You are crushing it, Erica. I'm definitely a fan, and I know the listeners will be fans. Yes. That means a lot. Thank you. Absolutely. (laughs) Hey, I like to wrap each episode with just some rapid-fire questions for fun. Okay, for sure. So don't even think about it. Just spit it out. All right. Your favorite food? (laughs) Pizza. Pizza. Ah, see? Mine too. Favorite drink? Favorite libation? Or it doesn't have to be alcoholic. It could be non-alcoholic. I would say, oh, pina colada. <laughs> ah, nice. I like it. Typical, uh, typical girly drink. It's all yeah, good. that's my wife's favorite too. It's all good. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> favorite sport? Basketball. Nice. How do you spend your free time when you're not doing music or working on the marketing and all that stuff? Beach. Beach. Good one. <laughs> I love the beach. Yeah. That's awesome. What activities do you enjoy on long flights when you're doing those tours? Napping <laughs> <laughs> and uh, watching a movie. Yeah. There you go. I'm a movie watcher. We're big movie buffs over here too. What's mm-hmm. the last song or a band or artist that you've listened to that you didn't work with, that you have no connections with? Uh, Snow Allegra. Her last album is so, so good. In my feels, uh, her album is so good. Every song, I just respect and admire her so much, her artistry and her, she has her own thing going and she's just a classic raw talent. So yeah, her last album. For sure. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Favorite uh, TV show that you're binging at the moment? I don't watch TV. Ah, good. <laughs> All right. Favorite movie? 
Favorite movie? Oh gosh, I would say The Gladiator or The Notebook. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Very <laughs> large extreme. That's like way on the left, way on the right. That's yes. hilarious. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Shopping, do you prefer online or brick and mortar? I want to be there in person to try it on. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. You have a dream collaboration? Yeah. I want to collab with Kendrick Lamar. There you go. Yeah. I think he's so great. He's, he's brilliant. Um, him or Bruno Mars. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Well, I mean, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a dream collaboration. He's, yeah, those are two greats. So come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, what would you do if you weren't a career musician? Dang, that's a great question. If I wasn't a career musician, I'd probably be a motivational speaker or <laughs> like a psychologist. Love that. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. I love ministering to people. I love I love like encouraging people. I love seeing people heal. And for me, my outlet for that is music because it's a very healing thing and it brings the world together. And it accesses people's heart in a way that other things can't, you know. And so That's right. if I didn't have music, then I maybe like, yeah, like therapy, just really hearing someone's story, connecting with them and just giving input and advice and speaking into their lives that would help them to heal and to, to grow, you know. That's awesome. <laughs> and it sounds yeah. like you're doing that through your music as well, like you said. So Yeah, I love perfect. it. Perfect. Perfect fit. <laughs> Erica, thank you so much for being a guest on The Career Musician. Thank you. Is that it? It just that is, it's two minutes past. I know. I know, really? right? I know. It's crazy. <laughs> it's 327. So, oh, yeah. wow. Okay. I guess I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. That was so much fun. It literally like passed by so fast. I'm I know, right? It does. It does go by yeah. fast. I'm so glad, really. <laughs> so much of what you said is so helpful, so enlightening. Mm. And it's so important that I keep saying young people, look, I'm 48, so Mm. I've been doing this a long time. And Mm -hmm. I do feel a passion that young people coming up in the biz, they need to know this stuff. They need to hear it. You know, a lot of the things that that you didn't know are the same things that I didn't know when I was that age, you know? And if there's two of us that that's the same, then come on, guaranteed there's thousands like that. Thousands. And hopefully, like, people can learn through others' experiences, you know? And not have to get burned like I did and you did. So take notes, like hopefully you don't have to go through these things. But if you do, you come out better and stronger and wiser. So it's all good. That's (laughs) it. There you go. So awesome. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and have a wonderful day. Thanks y'all for listening. The Career Musician Podcast is a member of the Pantheon Podcast Network, the first all-music-based podcast collective. For more info, visit pantheonpodcasts.com. Join the Career Musician Facebook group and get involved in the conversation. Binge previous seasons of the Career Musician Podcast and subscribe for all new episodes. Sign up for the Career Musician newsletter at thecareermusician.com. I'm just a nomad, nowhere man Writing the songs in this one-man band A nomad Hey, this is Nomad, host and creator of the Career Musician Podcast, and I am thoroughly stoked to be an official member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Pantheon Podcast Network is the first of its kind as an all-music-based podcast collective. Please be sure to check us out at pantheonpodcast.com for more info.